glad you're back with us today. My name is Butch Howard, and we're coming to you from Appalachian Baptist Church in Greer, South Carolina. We are right in the middle of our last session. We ran out of time last time. If you will remember, we're talking about the world system versus the uh, system or the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And so it's extremely important that we understand that these are two very different spiritual domains and dominions. So today we want to pick up uh, in the middle. We were uh, at this slide when time kind of ran out on us last week. So uh, as you see, the, the slide says that the world system is destined for destruction. And that sounds like we're starting out on a negative note, but uh, I want you to follow through with me today as we look at a number of passages of Scripture that hopefully will help us understand this isn't actually bad news, it's good news. Let's open in prayer and ask the Lord to help us, and then we want to dive right in to Revelation chapter 5. Uh, find your Bible and find your way there. I believe you will enjoy this particular portion of Scripture and others that we will deal with as we move through this session today. Father God, we love you. We are so thankful for your love for us. Literally every day, you shower your love, your mercy, your grace upon us. We are blessed in so many wonderful ways. So today, Lord, we praise you and thank you. We, we Lord, just want to exalt your name as we get into your holy word today. We're talking about spiritual dominions, Lord, it's on your heart. You've said so much about these various spiritual dominions throughout your word. We know that it matters to you. My prayer today, Father, is that you will speak through this clay vessel and share your heart with us. Help us to be receiving with uh, joy, with hunger, with thirst, uh, with attention. Uh, to the details that the Holy Spirit will reveal to us today. And bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As we begin with the fifth chapter now, the scene here is a heavenly scene, but it's important that we understand. We read last week in Daniel 2 and verse 44 that the kingdoms of the world would ultimately come from ten kings, which are the toes on Daniel's image that he that Nebuchadnezzar saw in the dream and Daniel interpreted the dream to King Nebuchadnezzar and it detailed the last days. These ten kings are going to create a global kingdom. All through scripture we find passage after passage that helps us see how this comes together through the centuries and through the millennia of time that has passed. You and I today are living in the first generation of humanity that has all of the capabilities in place to fulfill the prophecies of the end of days. No other generation has had all the pieces. Now, there are a couple of things that have not yet fully developed, but the pieces are gravitating together. They're coming together. We now have ten regions in our world, and so eventually these ten kings are going to appoint the Antichrist. The Antichrist will be uh, considered a, a very intelligent, very capable, strong man. He will speak with authority, and he has the gift of great swelling words, according to Daniel. And through peace, he is actually going to subjugate and enslave masses of humanity. So in Daniel 2.44, it talks about the stone that strikes the image at the feet and causes the entire image to crumble. The scene in chapter 5 is a heavenly scene. John sees the heavenly host, the church, now raptured in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 4 says this. I'm sorry, verse 9. 
Verse 9 says this, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Now the seals will be the first set of judgments that will take place during the Great Tribulation period. The saints are in heaven. That lets us know the church isn't on the earth when the Great Tribulation begins. The seals are the first, seven of them. There will be a total of 28 diverse judgments that will be poured out, that will unfold upon the earth and its inhabitants. To open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, now watch this, and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. So we're not talking about angels here. We're talking about human beings that have been blood bought, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, and are now redeemed out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. This is a global collection of believers. It's hard for us to comprehend today how God is using his church to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. We here at Appalachian Baptist Church, or a, very, a missional church, we have taken Acts 1-8 very, very literally. We are witnesses of Jesus Christ. We tell others what we have seen, what we've heard, what we have experienced from Jesus. That's what an eyewitness is. And we've taken that message to our Jerusalem, which is the Greer area here, the, uh, the towns uh, and cities that are in our area here, our Jerusalem and our Judea is our state, our Samaria, according to Acts 1-8, are those people who are not like us. They're different. Uh, in the city of Greer, we've, we've become an international city because of international plants that have uh, built uh, built plants here and they employ thousands of people and so we have become a, a very multi-racial multinational type of community here in our part of the, the state of South Carolina that's those who are not like us and then finally to the uttermost parts of the earth our vision statement here says that Appalachia is a church without walls for a city and a world without Jesus, without Christ, okay? So, now watch verse 10, because verse 10 gives you the distinctiveness of a dominion. And I want you to see this. A lot of people have chosen not to recognize that the church is an authority. It's an authority. It is a spiritual authority. Watch verse 10 and has made us unto God, our God, kings and priests. Then notice what it says next. We shall reign or rule on the earth. So the kingdom of Antichrist is going to be destroyed. The world system is going to be destroyed. Now, if you want to read about this, we don't have time today. We've got to move uh, forward. But if you will read the 17th and 18th chapters of the book of Revelation, it gives us the account of Great Babylon falling. Great Babylon is a word that describes this global empire. It's going to collapse. It's going to be destroyed in one day and in one hour, chapter 18. It is an amazing thing to read what is going to happen in fact, that level of destruction could only happen in the modern day. In previous times in history, you could not have destroyed a world system in a matter of one hour. Today, with all sorts of weaponry, we could bring the world completely down in the space of one hour if the right scenario of events uh, unfolded. So it's important for us to understand. So the church is indestructible while the world is headed for destruction. Now humanity has always rejected Jesus. That's a given today. Uh, we heard this past week at the campaign rallies 
One was the Republican vice presidential candidate. The other was the Democratic presidential ca uh, candidate. In both rallies, this statement was made, Jesus is Lord. We had two very, very different responses from the candidate. We're not here to tell you how to vote, but if you are a child of God and you have seen the videotape of those two campaign speeches, then you understand that the world system hates Jesus Christ. And that should be all we need to know. I'm not against people, but I am against evil systems. And globalism is an evil, evil system. We looked at 1 John 4 and verse 3 last week when the Apostle John said that spirit of Antichrist was already at work then. Now, according to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 and other places that we read last week, the kingdom of the Antichrist is the final Gentile world power. After the Antichrist and the world system, Babylon the Great, collapses, it is burned with fire. It will be the culmination of what we call the Great Tribulation Period. So the Gentile empires, which ironically have ruled the world since God sent Israel into the nations at the time of the Babylonian captivity. So now that scenario of moving from uh, God's chosen people, the Jew, grafting in the Gentile, the Gentile world empires has been now working since about 536 B.C. That's how long the Gentiles have ruled. Now, Jesus is something in Luke chapter 21. I want you to go there for just a minute. We've got to hurry. But in Luke chapter 21, the Lord says something about these times of the Gentiles. Look at verse 24. He mentions Israel specifically in the city of Jerusalem in this passage as he talks about the end of days. Watch carefully what Jesus says in the 24th verse. And they, the Jews, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The Apostle Paul writes a letter about this and uh, later about this, I should say, in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. I encourage you to study these passages, Romans 9, 10, and 11. Paul explains to us that God has not cast away the Jewish people nor the Jewish nation, but because of their unbelief and their rejection of Jesus as their Messiah, God has moved them to the side. He's not destroyed them. He has not abandoned them. He has moved him to the side, and now for almost 2,000 years, he has been working with Gentile peoples. And the Gentiles have responded favorably to the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church today is predominantly made up of Gentile peoples all over the world. If you were not a Jew by DNA, then you were a Gentile. When we get saved, we lose that Gentile distinction, as do the Jews. A Jew comes to faith in Jesus, is no longer a Jew. Gentile comes to faith in Christ, is no longer Gentile. We are now part of the church. That's a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. So he has always been hated. But as you see here, he has always been sovereign. Colossians uh, chapter 1, this verse always, always, always thrills my heart every time that I read it. And I want to go there today. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 16 and 17. Please understand what he says here. 16 and 17. For by him were all things created. We're talking about Jesus. He's very clearly the subject as we read the preceding verses. 
For by him, by Jesus, were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, that are under the earth, in another passage, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, these spiritual dominions have been allowed. They were created by Jesus to accomplish his sovereign, eternal purpose. All things, underline it, were created by him and for him. Verse 17, and he is before, he precedes all things. Jesus Christ did not originate in Bethlehem's manger. A couple of months, we're going to celebrate Christmas, and it's baby Jesus' time around the world. But let's understand something. Jesus existed long before Bethlehem's manger. He has always been, and he shall forevermore be. He was present, and he was the creator of God. In Genesis chapter 1. The word Elohim is the word for God in Genesis 1 1. The Bible says in Genesis 1 1, God, Elohim, created the heaven and the earth as a plural form. In verse about verse 26 of that first chapter, he says, God said, Elohim said, Let us make man in our image. One God, three manifestations. Father, Son, and Spirit. Jesus is Son through the virgin birth. But Father, Son, and Spirit exist as one. We read that in John chapter 17. So he says, He is before all things. Now watch this. And by him all things consist. So the kingdom of Christ is eternal and it's universal. You say, if that is true, why is there so much evil in the world? There are a number of reasons, and we could get into that. It would take a side uh, road off of the path we're currently on, so we must guard against that. But we must also understand that God has a plan and purpose that is always focused on, centered upon human redemption in terms of this planet. He knew before he ever formed this third rock from the sun, as it's been referred, he knew about sin, he knew about humanity, he knew about depravity, he knew about the need for the cross and for the blood and for eternal salvation. He has been managing this redemptive plan before he ever made Adam. He will continue to manage this sovereign plan after the last human has been born, lived, and died. So he is sovereign over everyone and everything and will continue to do that. There's something else we need to understand when, he, when we begin to deal with these spiritual dominions. A lot of people don't understand this, but Satan, formerly Lucifer, is not a god. He is not a god of any kind. He is not self-existent, nor is he eternal, nor is he omnipresent, omni, uh, omniscient, omnipotent. He is none of these things that God is. So understand this. The creature cannot destroy the creator. That's the only statement any of us really need to put in our memory banks and ponder, consider, latch on to. A creature cannot destroy the creator. It's just not possible. In fact, watch this. If Satan could destroy God, he, Lucifer, Satan, would cease to exist because he's done away with the one that's holding everything together. It is not remotely, on the grandest schemes of probability, of all the, of all the mathematical algorithms you could create, there isn't one where Lucifer survives trying to take God off his throne. The creature cannot destroy the creator. 
Satan is an angel. The Antichrist, this one leader that's coming on the scene soon now, is a man. He's just a man. For a brief period of time, Jesus will allow this man to be literally possessed by Satan. We read this in, in Revelation chapter 13. The devil will take over this man, and he will be supernaturally empowered. But while Satan is an angel, he is not God. He has grave limitations. He cannot remotely come close. You say, well, he's referred to as the God of this world in 2 Corinthians. Yes, he is. Notice his little g. He is worshipped by man, but he is not a god. No more than a statue that's made out of stone or wood or metal is a god. It's simply an idol that's been erected. People who worship Satan are idol worshipers. He is not a god, cannot become a god. Satan is a created being. So both Satan... Both Satan and the Antichrist are going to be destroyed. Now watch. We're going to read a couple of passages of scriptures that are very important. And you've, you've read these. You know these verses if you're a student of the scripture. But, but they bear repeating today uh, in a very important way. Jesus is Lord. He's not going to be Lord at some time in the future. Let me say it again this way. You do not, cannot make Jesus Lord of your life. It's said a lot by preachers. It's written a lot in books. But you can't make Jesus Lord. He already is. No mere mortal can make Jesus Lord. He is Lord. So let's go back to the left, just a few pages, to the book of Philippians. Chapter 2, I want you to look very carefully. Verse 6 says, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, because he is God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. He took a form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men. He looked like, talked like, he was a man in flesh. Verse 8, in being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and he became obedient unto death. The one who is life personified, the one who gives life to everything and everyone that has ever existed. We read it in John chapter 1, back in the beginning of the study. In him was life, and the life was the light of the world. This one who is life took upon himself mortality, and it says in this verse, he became obedient to death. The cross, friend, proved that Jesus Christ was human. He died. The resurrection proved that he is God. He came alive again. Jesus Christ has been amply called the God-man. The only difference in Jesus and you and I on the human side is that he did not have sin nature. He did not have depravity. And the reason for that is the virgin birth. Okay? And this is why the virgin birth is what we call a cardinal truth in the Scripture. We will not compromise that. The Bible says that in multiple places, we believe the Bible. You say virgin birth is impossible. I'll quote to you Luke 137. Look it up. Luke 137. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. Okay, so when we look at it this way, it's important that we see that Jesus was fully human. Jesus also is fully God. And so let's keep reading here. Wherefore, verse 9, God has highly exalted him 
and given to him a name that is above every name. Look at it on the page. This is a verse I've committed to memory years and years ago. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. Or they're going to confess. Let's look at it. Look at what he says. That at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Even the people in hell will declare one day, every tongue shall confess that Jesus is, not is going to be. This verse doesn't say Jesus will be Lord. It says Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, when we think about all of the swirling turbulence in our time, the literally hurricane force winds and tsunami waves of time, uh, Luke 21, Jesus even used those very terms. He said the sea and the waves roaring. That's where our hurricanes come from. They come from the sea. The sea and the waves roaring. Listen. That time is here. It's now. And we must understand that as these things move closer and closer to the end of days, God's word is going to continue to be fulfilled. It cannot be otherwise. We have people today who believe that if we pay more taxes or we have this policy or we do that or the other or we stop doing this, that we can save the environment, we can save the planet. Please understand something. Now, I'm not a fatalist, but I believe God's word. The Bible writes in Revelation about a time when it will be so hot, men's tongues will swell out of their mouths, and they will be scorched with fierce heat. The environmentalists are not going to be able to stop this. There are going to be plagues that literally it will take the lives of three-fourths of the global population. These things are written here, and they must be fulfilled. It can't be So well, that's very depressing. That's, that's frightening. That's terrifying even. Watch this. God has everything under control. He's already told you how long that period will last. It's not going to go on for years and years and years. 42 months. 42 months. Not one day more. Not one day more. 42 months. God has this planet under absolute control. He is ruling right now. We're about 10 days, 11 days away from the election, um, maybe more like 14 days away from the election, and the entire nation's uh, torn up. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there's some powerful emotions and opinions uh, on both sides of the equation. God already knows who's going to win. And you may lose the election or I may lose the election, but this you need to know. God will not lose the election. He will put into office the person that best guides the world toward where God is going now. We don't know his timepiece. We don't know where we are in that equation. What we do know is God is in control. We're not citizens of this country anyway, really. We're citizens of the kingdom, the dominion of heaven. And that should matter to us far more than who wins the election on November the 5th. We're out of time today, but I hope that you understand that there can be no other outcome. The Bible says heaven and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Till every jot and every tittle has been fulfilled. Those are the diacritical markings in the Greek language. That's an amazing thing. God is going to stay in control today, tomorrow, always. So, friend, put your faith in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Until this time next week, God bless you.